Rosetta is the subject. Um, it's, it's, it's one of those science projects that I think absolutely everybody knows about. And uh, as you could see from the abstract, Ian didn't know what he was going to talk about. Hopefully he does now, and he's going to tell us uh, what has happened at least up to now. So, Ian Wright. Yeah, thanks very much, John. Um, yes, Rosetta, the story so far, or if in the flyer, Rosetta, the story so far, question mark, which is uh, nicely mysterious, so we, we'll see what happens here. Um, now, um, John's introduced himself, but uh, I had the pleasure of uh, uh, an evening with him last Friday at the Royal Astronomical <laughs> Society Dining Club, uh, where uh, we talked about such weighty matters as the uh, Great British Bake Off, um, the rugby, uh, Jeremy Corbyn. I don't actually remember talking about any astronomy, John. But, uh, um, and, and, and John uh, has been uh, actually part of the, the Rosetta story that I'm going to recount because um, he, he did move and, and bring his group uh, to, to the Open University to join us. And then he, he worked with me on, uh, on, on the Rosetta project uh, that we're on. And it's, um, it, it, it's one of the chores of, 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 uh, of the job, if you're involved with space missions, is that you have to go to the launch, the rocket launch. This actually is a requirement to, to go there for no-go go decisions. But there's a huge amount hanging about waiting for a rocket launch, and this one got delayed, and we were stuck out in French Guiana and with really not much to do for, for memory, John. Um, there, was a, there was this golf range, which was a rather strange um, uh, thing to find. Um, and uh, unfortunately for, for John, we, we stayed out there so long because it kept getting delayed that I, he had to come back before it even went, as so he had an important staff meeting to go to or some such thing. So unfortunately, John never got to see the launch. So anyway, <coughs> I'll, um, I want to illustrate um, my interests in, in, in what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to start with this um, lovely picture of the Earth. I mean, I actually see it over there on the wall as well. Uh, absolutely fabulous place. Um, but of course, it didn't always look like that. This is what it looked like four and a half billion years ago. And uh, I, I mean, you, you know, you could, like, if you're an alien passing in a spaceship, you could have stuck some life on the planet at that point and it wouldn't have survived 10 seconds. Um, this is a period of time that the geologists called the Hadean after Hades because um, it was clearly horrendous and the Earth was forming by impacts and growing and all the rest of it. So, um, you know, clearly uh, that was not a place where life could have, could have got going. Now, if we, uh, if we think about this in, in the context of the history of the universe, um, you, you'll be familiar with this timeline running from the Big Bang up until now. And uh, this was a poster that we put together when we used to do Stargazing Live with the, with the BBC. Uh, so time running across here. Um, and here's the present day Earth uh, up here uh, at about 13 point, I think it says 13.7 billion years. Uh, of course, it's 13.8 billion years now. Um, and the, the interesting thing about this is that, uh, uh, at least according to the way we uh, understand the paradigms, is that um, you know there, there was nothing, uh, and then there was the Big Bang, and then there was something. And in terms of uh, the Earth, here we are, present day here, and this is where we formed four and a half billion years ago. Uh, and what we do know is that somewhere in between those two limits, life must have got started. I mean, we are here as demonstrable evidence for that. Um, and so my interest is in, is in how you went from one state to another, um, you know, sort of, sort of a biological world to a biological one. And um, uh, this is something called the phylogenetic tree of life. I, I guess people might be aware of it. Uh, using genetics, uh, you can work out that every living thing on Earth appears to actually be related to each other through this common a set of branches that comes down to a hypothetical concept called the, the last universal common ancestor. And it seems that we all evolved somehow or other from, from, from the starting point. Um, we, we're up here, look, uh, next to slime moulds and, <laughs> and, and, and things like that. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm turn the tree of life on its side so that time runs uh, uh, across from left to right. 
And what I'm interested in is what are the inputs that go into the bottom end of this, of this tree of life? So we can think about star formation regions. We can think about the process of planetary formation. I mean, planets formed around stars in many different cycles, and they are contributing elements and, and uh, whatever to, to this uh, whole milieu. And here we're going to pick up the story with, uh, with comets themselves adding, adding input. And so uh, the way I like to see it is that we've got this tree of life, but then prior to that, we have what I call the roots of life. These are these chemical processes that brought things together, a, co a sort of collection of things together, and put them in right at the base of this, uh, of this tree of life. And then somehow or another, um, uh, life took hold and, and got started. But what I'm interested in is what happens on this side uh, of that dotted line. And, and in particular, it's why I've spent a long time um, studying comets. And what we do know, of course, is that um, notwithstanding the Hadean and the, the terrible start to the Earth, I mean, at some point, obviously, it cooled down to the point where we got a nice solid surface and liquid water was um, present. And so some of these materials were being added to the surface. And the question then is, what, what role, if any, did, did comets play to that? Because, as I say, you could have made the Earth from comets, um, but they were heated up to, uh, to the point where a any interest in chemistry in them was probably reset. So what we're looking for is, was there an input of, um, of, of abiotic chemistry uh, that brought things to the surface of the primitive Earth and from which life ultimately got started? Now, before we get into that, um, uh, hands up anyone who's, uh, who's seen this lovely video that was uh, released, I think it was last week, from the Royal Observatory. Um, it's, uh, it's absolutely fantastic. fantastic. I, I do recommend it. It's on their Vimeo uh, site, uh, and I've got a few stills from it. Um, we worked with the Royal Observatory people to, to put this together, and it's, uh, it's what they call a claymation um, thing. So here we are. We've got a, for centuries, you know, humans have, uh, have been looking at comets in the sky, um, ancient, from ancient civilizations to, uh, to early astronomers. Um, and right up to the current generation of uh, scientists and, and engineers who created this daring mission to, uh, to explore a, a comet close up. Uh, the mission is called Rosetta. The team behind it, the European Space Agency. Um, and now, this is quite interesting because um, those of us who've been involved with this for a long time, we, we actually designed this, uh, this mission to go to a, a comet called 46P or Vertanen. And uh, because of a problem with the uh, with Ariane, Ariane launch program, uh, that got delayed. And because of that, um, the comet was no longer in the right or position in space for us to visit. So we had to come up with a, an alternative idea, which was um, ultimately 67P, uh, Churyumov Gerasimenko. Um, interesting thing is that Vertanen was a smaller comet than 67P. So Everything on the lander, for instance, was, was configured for the, the gravity of a smaller body. So the actual, uh, uh, the Philae lander had to be modified uh, at the launch site during the actual year delay, um, because otherwise the legs wouldn't have, uh, uh, have worked uh, during the landing. So here we are in uh, uh, November uh, 2014, Rosetta launching uh, Philae down to the surface. Um, However, the harpoons and the rockets designed to lock the probe onto the surface failed to fire. Now, little Philae, weighing as little as an AAA battery, I mean, that's because of the microgravity environment that it's in. So this thing would be about 100 kilograms on Earth, but that's, a, that's what it would feel like in, uh, on the surface of the comet. Uh, it bounced up, uh, then landed down, only to bounce again. The instruments on board were unharmed. But Phil I landed in a crevice that was uh, too dark for solar power. The race was on. As the mission control team downloaded the data before Phil I's battery was dead. Inter interestingly, Phil I's battery uh, it's, it has two batteries on it a primary battery and a secondary battery. The primary battery um, was launched from Earth fully charged uh, and then. It, that was it. it was, it's not a rechargeable battery. So this is the battery that we were using uh, at this point in time. And of course, it was steadily running out, never ever to be, to be recharged. Um, for that, we have to rely on uh, secondary batteries. 
Uh, they managed to gather over 80% uh, of the data um, before the uh, filly went into hibernation. Uh, then in June 2015, uh, they were overjoyed to uh, that Phil I started to transmit again, and I think when I wrote the thing in the for the for the flyer, which I think was in April, I wrote that, that uh, we didn't know that, so uh, we did wake up, we did re-establish communication, but we've not been able to get a stable uh, connection that have allowed us to to do sensible things. We've been commanding the lander to do all kinds of things, and it may well have been doing them, but it has not unfortunately yet been able to send us back uh, any data. <coughs> Uh, as 67 b approached the sun, the energy strike in the comet increased, uh, enough to bring Philae back to life, so that's, uh, that's where we are with that. Um, so use it, using the data, um, scientists have been learning about the chemical composition of the surface uh, and, and its atmosphere, so, uh, which is basically the formation of the coma. And uh, we've discovered that there are uh, organic compounds on the surface of the comet, uh, including four compounds that have actually never been detected in, in comets before. Um, and on the basis of its haphazard landing, um, uh, we've been able to uh, uh, actually, uh, you know, from first-hand experience, find out that some of the uh, areas are very soft, they're like snow, and other areas are, are as hard as uh, volcanic rock. So that's, that's really interesting. That wasn't anything that we ever intended to get from the mission, because it was simply meant to land in one place. And uh, then the, the, the video ends with, uh, with, with this uh, view about um, two different t types of comets. Comets from the so-called Kuiper Belt, um, which is in orbit around the sort of Neptune, Pluto and beyond region in the same plane as the, as the planet. And uh, the New Horizons uh, mission, which has just visited there, has been uh, taking close-ups of, uh, of Pluto and Charon and so on. Uh, and so um, it's very interesting that um, the Comet 67P ultimately came from the Kuiper Belt, so that we have two missions that have taken a very long time to get to, to each of their respective places, uh, with this fab fabulous legacy of data from things that people, scientists, will be working on, I would imagine, for the next 10 years, trying to really understand their connections and relationships. And then, um, you, you know, future missions might uh, even think about going beyond the Kuiper Belt to this spherical shell of comets that uh, exists around the solar system and there's something like 10 to the power of 13 comets um, in this uh, hypothetical Oort cloud. So anyway that's a, that's, a, that's a great video that and really that, that could just be my talk I think really to, to be honest. Um, um, but anyway let's uh, again I mean there must be people here who've seen comets yes yeah uh, you never see them like that though do you? I mean, um, you know, and, and down in London, I imagine it's extremely difficult to see them. But uh, these are the these are the, this is what it, this is what gives a comet its name, a hairy star, the the, the thing with the tail. Uh, this was Comet McNaught that was visible, unfortunately, from the southern hemisphere uh, a few years ago, but it was uh, truly spectacular. And um, uh, to try and illustrate something about the sizes of comets, again, I, I expect some of you know this. Um, when you, when you see these comets, these are the biggest uh, features in the solar system that you can actually see. And in many cases, you can see this by, uh, with the naked eye. This is Comet Holmes, which I was able to see from my back garden uh, a few years ago. Uh, it's basically a comet that suddenly kind of exploded, uh, you know, with no warning. And um, that sort of spherical smudge, I mean, that was as big as, uh, as, the, as the full moon in, in the sky. You, you could almost couldn't miss it. But in terms of its actual size, I've put the, um, the Earth on there for scale. So again, so st straight away you see that um, the, uh, that's quite a big structure, that. And to illustrate it, uh, uh, again, here's a picture of um, a recent comet, Comet Lovejoy, uh, taken from the International Space Station. Again, lovely picture, and you can see the, uh, sort of two tails um, uh, forming from the, from the comet there. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to turn that on its side, and then I'm going to blow that bit up so that we're, we're looking at that. And then on the basis of that, I can put the Earth on for scale uh, compared to that tail. And not necessarily for Lovejoy, but for a, a comet like this, um, that tail would extend for 150 slides um, that way. So the point I'm trying to labour here is that the cometary thing that you can see in these lovely pictures all by the naked eye is massive. The thing that produces it is tiny, um, I guess depending on your perspective. But here's a nice uh, ESA uh, image uh, of, uh, of 
what they think 67p would look like superimposed on London. So you get some idea of the scale of the nucleus that's making that truly enormous uh, um, um, structure. You know, you can walk from Big Ben to, uh, to Tower Bridge on the South Bank and it's a lovely walk uh, when it's sunny and, uh, you know, takes an hour or something. And, you know, that's it. That's the size of the, the nucleus. So um, we've got something, uh, something about the scale there. Now, uh, this is what, certainly when I came into the business, this was the paradigm for what comets were. And this is, uh, this is Fred Whipple. Um, and he came up with this idea that comets were dirty snowballs. And uh, I'm not quite sure exactly what this model is made of, but, you know, that's kind of what he, you know, it was, meant, it was meant to be a white kind of object made out of water ice with a bit of a dusting of, uh, of something on it. D dirty snowball. Um, then came uh, Giotto. And uh, I was certainly a professional sort of, act, uh, you know, research scientist at this point. And um, I, I remember this, uh, the night of the encounter pretty well. I uh, watched it live on TV. And I also remember that uh, the Star Trekkers had difficulty um, kind of observing the comet um, because they expected it to be white. And it wasn't. It was black. Um, and this is a great uh, image I got off the web, I'm not quite sure um, what the original source is, but this shows a comparison of um, the albedos of, of, of four well-known objects, the Earth, uh, Enceladus, and the Moon, and I, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. Well, what I did, I, I put it in Photoshop it, a few times, in fact, to, to blow it up, just to convince myself there was actually something there. Um, but, you know, it, these comets are black. They are the blackest things um, in the solar system. They're blacker than any clothes that you wear. It's more like uh, the, t the black toner you get in a, in a pr print, uh, printer cartridge. So straight away, just looking at this, it doesn't look like an, um, a dirty snowball. So the, the paradigm uh, there is, 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 is quite wrong in a way. So let's start with a, um, I well, I'll, I'll show you a few um, results from the, the mission itself, and then I'll, I'll revert to a kind of potted history of, uh, of my involvement with it. And uh, I'll start with these because I think, just think they're lovely images. And um, uh, this is, these are results that have been made quite recently um, uh, of, of both the plasma and the magnetic field. And um, the real pain about this is that, uh, that to do it, the spacecraft needs to be a long way away from the comet. So most scientists on, on the mission don't like this bit because it's like we're too far away to do anything, but the plasma people need to be a long way away. And um, we've been doing some of those measurements just recently, and I think we're heading back in towards the, the, the comet now. Um, but of course, this is a, uh, an absolutely um, vital part of the actual mission itself. And so here's a, um, uh, a, a, a simulation of, um, of the plasma particles uh, 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 um, bending around the cometary nucleus at, at perihelion. <coughs> and similarly, these are results of, uh, of how mag the magnetic field lines are getting bent um, as a comet interacts with the uh, with the solar wind, um, so these are these are results that are hot off the press. And uh, in terms of people, I mean, I get people probably know about this, but if you don't, um, ESA has done an absolutely first-rate job of um, the public engagement and the PR aspects of this mission. And John can cor correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe this is the first time they've managed to do it, anything like this. And I think they probably learned from uh, NASA's Curiosity um, mission, and, and they thought, well, look, well, we'll do the same thing with, with Rosetta, which is a very high-risk thing to do, I think. Um, but they've clearly done a great job. And so these resources go onto their ESA blog site, and um, uh, they, they're coming out uh, before this work is even uh, published in some cases, because... Uh, the scientists have been very keen to um, uh, to make these results known. So, if you want to follow these resources up, you know this isn't my work. This is just simply <coughs> stuff that's taken from their resources. <coughs> and so, this is some fairly recent work that's been um, uh, looking at the layering uh, of the of the nucleus at close up. And on the basis of um, this layering, they have been able to come to the conclusion that. Uh, the two um, lobes of, of this comet are actually separate, uh, separate bodies that presumably joined uh, early on uh, in its history. So it is a, um, a, a bilobite a, a bi structure. Now, I have to say, 
at the professional level, there's quite a few um, discussions and disagreements about this, but this, this is one interpretation of it. The fascinating thing about this is, uh, to, my, to my way of thinking, is that although we've been to a single comet, we've actually been to two, uh, two different ones. And uh, interesting, if we're clever enough now, we may be able to do some things with uh, remote observations to actually <coughs> distinguish differences between the two lobes, say, for instance, in terms of their chemical composition or whatever. Again, that's, uh, that's all hot off the press, that, that stuff. And here's something else which is um, hot off the press, and it's about the daily water cycle. See, it's a strange thing. Uh, we, kind of, we kind of imagine that comets are made out of, of water ice, and we know that those comas, the, the, the tails, have lots of water in them, and yet the surface is black. So somehow or other, the water has to get out of the comet. And uh, this is some work that's been done uh, recently about, being, uh, about trying to understand this. And uh, again, there's, a, there's an animation for this, um, which I can just flick through here. And uh, on this, you'll see that the, the blue colouring is, is the water ice, um, and you can see some black shadows. And as it rotates, uh, you can see how the distribution of that water um, changes on the, sub uh, on the, on the surface. Um, basically, what happens when it's in shadow, uh, you, you don't see any ice. And as soon as it comes out of shadow, you see some ice. Uh, or some brightening, should I say, um, and, and it then drops off quite, quite quickly. And so the, the feeling is that what's happening is that the water is uh, migrating through the crust and uh, pretty much all the time, except that when it's in shadow, it freezes. Um, and it freezes below the surface. <coughs> Um, uh, and then as it comes out, out of the shadow, it kind of warms up and starts migrating again and literally comes out in quite a burst. Now, the interesting thing about that is that... Um, uh, there's, there's, some, there's some terrifying things here uh, where physicists and chemists need to talk uh, to each other because um, this is where the best understanding from this stuff is going to come from. The physicists always consider the physical properties, the temperature, whatever it is, and the chemists think about the chemical compositions. But clearly one must be influencing the other. And this is the first time in a, in a mission to a comet that we've ever got close to uh, the chance of being able to do things like that. Anyway, so... Um, I'll talk now about my involvement with, uh, well, mine and John's I I involvement uh, um, uh, with, uh, with the, uh, the filling part of the mission. And um, we recently um, published a, a special issue in the, the journal Science, uh, I think in July, which um, gives our first results from, from the actual encounter. <coughs> so let's think about some of the things that have happened in recent times. So this was, uh, this was January uh, last year. Uh, when we're all rather nervously um, waiting for the spacecraft to come out of deep, uh, deep hibernation. And um, it, it's amazing to think that that little blip there in that signal was uh, uh, a subject of such joy. It, it, actually, uh, it actually was about 20 or 30 minutes late, um, uh, which was a real problem because all things being equal, the engineers knew exactly when this was supposed to uh, return. Uh, I mean, that was, this blip is the signal that says the spacecraft has woken up. Um, and and the, the bottom line is that on board the spacecraft, things weren't working properly. So in, in the best tradition of things, it, it switched the computer off and switched it back on again. And, and, uh, and, and, and that took half an hour to reboot. So, uh, so we, we, we're glad about that. And then um, I can't quite think when that was. It was probably April, May sometime. Uh, we got our first image of the actual comet. And again, that's kind of quite... Uh, it was quite... Pleasing to know that we were where we thought we were, uh, and not only that, the comet was where we, we hoped it, uh, it was going to be. So this is the, this is the comet here, um, way before it's uh, started to develop any features that would give it um, the name comet. And so what, what we were doing over, over the course of the year is uh, we were kind of learning how we were going to land this phylli onto the surface of this comet. And so we had, we had all these practice campaigns because we knew that by the time we got for doing it for real, time would be pretty tight and um, we, we couldn't learn on the job. We had to learn beforehand. So this is what we worked with. Uh, this was the best shape model of the comet that we, uh, that we had. And this is another one of our colleagues, Simon Green, who works at the Open University. He worked on this. And they, on the basis of light curve measurements that it made from the surface of the Earth, uh, they told us it was a nice potato shape, so that was uh, that was what we worked. We spent months on this, uh, uh, working out a land on on that. 
And then, of course, in uh, <laughs> Ju July or whatever it was, uh, you know, we got, we got this image, and, and this really was, you know, excuse me, this was an oh shit moment. Uh, <laughs> Because uh, this clearly meant that anything we'd, we'd been practicing for was completely, uh, you know, it wasn't a waste of time, but it, we had to start again, basically, because the comet clearly wasn't looking much like a potato. And uh, I, I personally find this an absolutely iconic image of, uh, of, of 67p. Uh, this is obviously taken much later on when we're, when we're getting close up. Um, and as I say, I've already pointed to the fact now that we think this is a bilobate structure with possibly two different sorts of comets welded together at some point in its, uh, its early history. So I kind of, I've become quite curious about this as to, as to why we were so shocked uh, at, at, at this thing. And so I kind of just, uh, you know, I did just for, the, but for this talk, I did some, you know, web searching and, and thought, well, you know, what do we know about some of the comets we've already visited close up from space missions? <laughs> And uh, I don't know, are there any experts out there? I think this is Hartley 2, this is Borelli, that's the uh, Halley image, and that's 67p. That's well, my way of thinking, they don't, those at least don't look all that different. So I think as time's gone by, we've become, uh, we, we sort of try to wonder why we're so surprised at the shape. We perhaps would have been more surprised if it was a potato. Um, <laughs> Although not all comets look like this, uh, some are, are relatively spherical. So, you know, quite probably there is some uh, broad difference here between comets. You know, there are spherical ones and there are these bilobate ones. And the question really is, you know, how, how does one evolve into another? Do, do, do two circular ones, two spherical ones come together, or does a, uh, or, or you know, do, do, does a spherical one ultimately start to erode in the middle? And it's a, it's a really active area of, uh, of research and. Um, you know, as I say, there'll be discussions about this for many years to come. So, uh, this is where I started. Uh, John alluded to the fact I, um, I did my PhD in Cambridge, and this was uh, you know, many decades ago. And um, so this is a, a photo from the archive. I mean, some, some of you might recognise some of these. This here is a, it's a PDP-11. Uh, it's, a, it's a computer. I mean... Um, Prior to that, the only computers I'd had any access to were mainframe computers where you needed punch cards and, and all this kind of stuff. And for my PhD, I had my own computer in the laboratory. I mean, back then, this was absolutely uh, amazing. And um, here's an instrument called a mass spectrometer. And here's an extraction line here, gas extraction line, where we were actually uh, trying to study uh, lunar samples here. And a rack of sort of... Um, uh, electronics, some of which were homemade. Uh, I mean, I didn't have a background in electronics, but I, I made some of these boxes because um, we were trying to make these instruments that could do specific things. We, we, you know, we wanted to do things that you couldn't you couldn't just buy an instrument to do. We were looking to do some uh, uh, specific things, and this this is work I did in the in the group of uh, Colin Pillinger at, uh, at Cambridge. So, um, and then. Uh, well, this whole, this whole Rosetta thing started off um, pretty much at the same time as Giotto finished, which was in 1986. And uh, I don't know if people, can, can people see what this says? What, what's wrong about it? R Rosetta, in case you're not aware, it, it was proposed originally as a, a comet nucleus sample return mission. <laughs> and um, it was a joint ESA-NASA venture. And uh, I remember as a, as a, a young postdoc, um, being packed off to represent the Brits at one of these international meetings, um, which was quite daunting, um, where we were discussing how we were going uh, to how, how we were going to run this mission. And I remember sitting there thinking, bear in mind, I was an instrument builder, and I kind of knew the practicalities of what what was involved. And these top scientists were sitting around talking about how they wanted to uh, get a three meter long core of the cometary nucleus <laughs> and return it to Earth intact to preserve the uh, the stratigraphy of the ices and i think for me it was a defining moment to think this mission is never going to happen that is impossible um and so uh, but but uh, but we still carried on with this because it, it sounded quite good and um so when we moved to the open university i started building some some new instruments uh, specifically uh, to analyse these returned cometary nucleus samples. And this is an instrument called MS-86. I, I built it in 1986. And we actually only decommissioned it this year. And it's been running ever since. It's been an absolutely fantastic instrument. 
Um, you, you get some kind of sense of the, of the scale of it. Um, and uh, so this was what my career was going to be, studying uh, returned commentary samples in the laboratory. Well, of course, the, the thing was, it, it became both financially and technologically uh, impossible. And, um, and the Americans pulled out, or I don't know quite, you know, there were politics around what happened. But the, the, uh, the Europeans decided they still wanted to, to do this commentary mission. And, um, and so what they said to people like myself, who'd been, you know, thinking we would be part of this, they said, well, look, we know, you know, we can't bring the samples back to your laboratory. Can you take your laboratory to the comet? And, and so um, this is, this is what, what I was doing. And, and th this shows my kind of, you know, when I, when I really started changing track from thought of, of that from one thing to another. And they're dated, uh, this is the 14th of January 1993. So that kind of gives you a feeling for when I first started work on it. And these are the equivalent of a couple of back of the envelope sketches. I mean, they, they were on A4 sheets of uh, paper. And this was some concepts for what we could do if we sort of took our laboratory to the, um, to the comet and uh, worked on that for a whole year. So this is now uh, 27th of March 1994, which is uh, about a year later. And this is what I would call my system diagram, which explains the layout of the, of the instrument I uh, proposed that we could build. And we'll come back to the system diagram because in actual fact, this, it, it, it still surprises me that this is actually what we built. But again, I show that to, 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 to give you some kind of sense of time scale. And the instrument is based loosely on this one, uh, this system, which is called Finesse, which is still in our laboratory working now. There's a, there's a, there's a Welshman there for scale. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, you, you get some kind of sense of it. So, you know, can you take your laboratory uh, to a comet? I mean, how difficult can that be? You know? uh, oh, by the way, uh, you can only have 2.7 kilograms of mass. So this was clearly a, an absolutely huge challenge. But um, we worked with our colleagues at the Rutherford Appleton Lab. And um, so this is uh, the, the heart of the instrument that we built. This is uh, the mass spectrometer that we built. And the, the, the electrodes here, this part here, they're cylindrical. They, they're the size of a cotton reel. And, and that device would sit on the palm of your hand. And the whole thing weighs 240 grams. And that's a fully working instrument. And, and in fact, we have a duplicate of these actually in the, in the lab in, in Milton Keynes. And that's the whole instrument itself. So you, know, you saw that room size piece of equipment. There, there's a hand there for scale. The mass spectrometer I showed you is in that box inside there. These are gas tanks for part of the system. There's a load of pipes and valves, and, and this black box here is, the, is a black box with, uh, with the electronics in it. So um, we shrunk that stuff down to the size of a shoebox. And I, I'd, I'd be lying if I said it was 2.7 kilograms. It, it actually crept up to 4 kilograms, but it's still uh, a, a remarkable feat that we were able to do that. Uh, so we, we were building that uh, in the late 90s, and, um, and this then was integrated onto the Phil Islander in June 2001. Um, so if you can think about what the Phil Islander looks like, this is, this is what it looked like on day two of its construction. Uh, it was simply two pieces of metal bolted together. And unfortunately, we were the first instrument that had to be integrated, so we had to be on first. Uh, which is, I would never do this again, because you, you, you're getting a lot of trouble, because you, you're holding the whole thing up. Uh, so there we were integrated, and of course, as soon as we were on, then someone else was holding the whole thing up. And, and so our instrument is right in the centre of that, um, of that Phil Islander. June 2001. There, this is what John missed. Uh, this was the launch in March 2004. I have to say we weren't that close, thank God. Um, but... Uh, uh, Rocket launches are truly amazing, and I do recommend if any if, if anyone gets the chance to see them, get, go and see them. They're absolutely tremendous. So 2004, and uh, as you know, then it was a kind of 10-year uh, hike to to get to the actual comet. Now, as I say, this is a, this is this actual system diagram. Now, I appreciate you can't um, read this because this was never um, designed for a for a presentation, but. Um, this is, shows some of the complexity of it, and what I'll do is just run through the subcomponents. So, down at the start, we have a, a small oven. These ovens are um, two millimeters diameter by six millimeters length. So we drill down into the commentary nucleus, we collect the sample, put it in that oven. The oven's on a carousel, and it rotates around and connects to the instrument. 
Um, we then heat the samples up and uh, gases uh, are evolved into this section with uh, pipes and valves and, and chemical reactors. And what we're doing here is uh, conditioning the gas, turning it from one thing into another so that we can ultimately put it into the instrument. It then goes into something called the uh, gas chromatography columns. These are very, very long, thin pipes. Uh, that's actually what they are. And again, that helps with the separation of the gases. And it's driven by those gas tanks that I showed you, which contain helium gas. So just the fact that we've actually invented a system that can store helium gas in a tank in 10 years in space is, is remarkable in its own right. Um, we have a separate system here for part of the isotopic measurements that we're going to make. And then ultimately, there, there is the mass spectrometer, the thing that I, I said would fit on the palm of your hand. And um, what we've managed to do uh, since we've been on the surface are uh, we've been able to take gas uh, three different ways through the, through the system. Um, what I'm going to talk about uh, is, is just one of those, which is, um, which is what we call sniffing. So unfortunately, we don't use the tremendously sophisticated instrument we've got. We just simply look at gases that come up through the exhaust pipe. Um, but it's, uh, it, 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 yeah, we got some great results from that. <laughs> So uh, as we were approaching the comet, uh, after we woke up, from April onwards uh, last year, we started uh, running our instruments and making measurements as we got closer and closer and monitoring the fact that certain gases were changing. And there's some really interesting results in that, and we're in the process of writing them up at the moment. Um, this was to, we were doing this partly to just uh, check that the instrument still worked, learning how to use it and all that kind of jazz, um, but we got some interesting results as well. So this is the big day for us uh, uh, in November. Was it November the 14th? Oh, I've forgotten already. Um, and uh, so this, was, this is the Phil Islander looking back at the Rosetta spacecraft. So it's not a, not a great image because the, you know, the camera that took this wasn't designed to do that. But that's actually it. You can see, you can see the spacecraft here. There's the solar panels. Um, so we knew we'd been let go. And then uh, this, is, this was the, the first image that we got back from the spacecraft, which showed the, the lander going down. And uh, this was, uh, I was in this uh, room uh, at ESOC, um, the control center, where all the lander PIs were based. And this was the moment when we got this image up on the screen. You could, you could just see it here. What a bunch of kids, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so excited, it was, uh, it, it was tremendous. Uh, this, this, was a, this is a GIF that was made subsequently of all the images that were taken as the thing uh, went down. So that's, uh, that's great. It shows it going down to the surface. And then this is what actually happened on, uh, as it approached. So the, the, we're now looking down um, from the spacecraft to the surface of the comet. And you can see the lander at various points. And, and this is actually here was where it was scheduled to land. I can't remember. It was just a few meters away from where it was actually scheduled to land, which is quite remarkable. And uh, there are two images, uh, both before and after. This is the before image, and that's the after image. And I think you can see the three dents in there where, where the actual um, foot pads uh, in, impacted the surface. You can also see that they're not absolutely the way they should be. The spacecraft obviously twisted and, and, and kind of skipped a little bit. And, and then the harpoons didn't fire, and, and so it went off. Uh, and here it is over here at 1543, and that's... Uh, that's interesting. I'll come back to that. These were the images that we subsequently got back um, as the spacecraft. It, it had a camera pointing downwards as it, uh, as it was coming down. And uh, there it is getting closer with what the lander would look like for, for scale. And uh, you could see something about what the surface looks like there. There are some meter-sized boulders and some finer fragments. Uh, and that is actually the, the, the place where we actually kind of hit the surface. That's the next picture we took. Uh, clearly, we didn't uh, we didn't anchor and, and we carried on going. And um, okay, this is a picture that I've, I've drawn. Um, so here was our landing site up here at uh, Agilkia, and we came down, uh, didn't uh, didn't anchor, uh, went off a, a tangent effectively. Um, bearing in mind that uh, the spacecraft is coming straight down, but the comet is actually rotating hit the wall of this crater here, and ultimately started rattling around, hitting things and dragging along the floor. And, and it's somewhere now here, a good kilometer away, or whatever it is, in, in a site called the Bedos. And uh, the thing that's interesting, thing I'm gonna talk about now, is here's, here's that image again at 1543, taken by Rosetta. 
And you'll notice here, this is what we were actually doing. So here we are at 1543, uh, and we're actually running our instrument. So at the very time that this picture was taken. Now, it, this was programmed to do this, because in our minds, what we wanted to do was we, this thing was going to hit the surface. We thought, as soon as it's got down, we'll take some measurements as quickly as possible to check the instrument out, see if everything survived the landing. And we also imagined that maybe uh, the feet might be a bit warmer than the surface, and maybe it would just kind of warm up a few of the volatiles, and, and we'd actually see those. Um, that, that was our rationale. Now, we didn't do that on the ground. We were, we were 100 metres away at this point, but um, as you'll see, we did actually get some uh, results. Now, um, this, is, uh, this is another one of these ESA resources, and it actually shows what, a what actually happened, because obviously a few minutes after touchdown, we, we had to, I mean, the, the, the thing that we planned for all those months kind of had to be, go out the window to some extent, because uh, we hadn't landed. And, and so here are the separate instruments, uh, and here are the three days we were in operation at the surface till, till the battery runs out. And this is Ptolemy here. So these are the results I'm going to talk about here. We call these the scratch and sniff because that's effectively what happened. These, the, the, the spacecraft itself went into safe mode where we did a number of sniffing experiments. And what we're doing here is measuring the long-term evolution of the volatiles that are being released at the second landing site. And then here, this is when the battery is really going downhill. Uh, bearing in mind, we, we didn't sleep for three days here. We're just in the control room, you know, trying to run the instrument and whatever else. And, and that we call our last gasp. And we got some great data from that that we haven't actually um, published yet, uh, but, I, but I won't talk about those. OK, so here are the data. Now, I, there may be some mass spectrometrists here. There may not be, but to us, this is pure poetry. You know, this is, uh, this is what we, we would have, uh, you know, really hope to get something like this. And, and, and these data were coming back to Earth while this thing was still in, in the air after the bounce. So it was kind of a mixed emotion, hadn't landed properly, but we were getting results back that we could look at and say, yeah, you know what, these are good data, this, the, the, this, is, this is good stuff. So this is mass along here and this is intensity here. There's two different spectra there. Um, uh, so, so what you do when you get this is you say, well, all right, it's not quite what we expected to do because we were going to drill and do all those other things. But so what we'll do is get it, you, you choose your favourite um, collection of, uh, of cometary molecules that have been detected um, spectroscopically, and then you see if you can fit them. And uh, I tried all kinds of things like this, and, and the problem is you can sort of fit a number of things, and you're never particularly sure about... Uh, whether you've got the right fit or not. I mean, we can do this. We have to go back in the lab now and calibrate things. Uh, but, but at the time, we, we couldn't do it. So here we are. Let, let, let's look at these differently. And uh, what I think any of you can see is that, can you see this regularity here? You know, even if you know nothing about mass spectrometry, you can see there's something regular. It's not, it's not a random forest of peaks. It's not random noise. There's something there that is, is giving the game away as to what this actually is. And so, uh, as I say, I remember very much the um, Giotto encounter of, uh, with Halley, and I remember this, uh, this interesting observation um, uh, by one of the instruments of this um, material, uh, which they ultimately call polyoxymethylene. And the, the, the characteristic thing is this pattern. And so, uh, and this is another paper from the, from the same time where they tried to fit things to it. Uh, and... Um, the thing about uh, these results is these results were being made, obviously, as, the, as Giotto flew past Halley, and they were, they were made a l very long distance away, relatively speaking, uh, from the comet. And, and here we are, right on the surface, having just kicked up some dust and analysing the stuff in situ. So what I've done here is I've put the two spectra together in an Excel spreadsheet. I've taken out the water and the CO2, which are the major volatile species, interesting in their own right. Um, and then I've superimposed the, uh, the, the, the polyoxymethylene signal onto it. And whether it's right or wrong, I mean, clearly, you can begin to see that there's some correspondence here. And, and of course, our data are much better resolution than, the, than they were off, uh, off Halley. And um, this, is the, this would be the molecule. So even if you understand nothing about chemistry, I think you can see it's a fairly straightforward, quite simple molecule. Um, in ball and stick terms, this, uh, 
Uh, the black's carbon, this is hydrogen, this is oxygen, and just repeat. And, and the basic unit is formaldehyde. And of course, formaldehyde is a really, really uh, important molecule in, uh, in origin of life studies. And this particular image is out on a poster on, on Piccadilly. Um, now, uh, and, and again, it's, apologies if you, if you don't know about chemistry, but it is, it's quite simple stuff, okay? Carbon, two hydrogens, and an oxygen. Uh, you can have that either way around, uh, and then basically you, you just repeat this, and the key thing is, is to what you cap the ends with. And so I've got a few different ones here. There's hydrogen, uh, there's formaldehyde, and acetaldehyde, I think. So the bottom line is, in consideration of all of that, this is, this is what you'd get. You'd get a characteristic set of peaks, and uh, this is mass along here. Um, and you can see perhaps the pattern, you get a two, and then a two, and then you get repeating sets of three. But the distances in mass between the threes are, are different. And this just goes on and on for however big the chain is. And you can actually then fit that to this, uh, to this spectrum quite well. So we postulated that that's what we think this is. Uh, it's a component called polyoxymethylene. But it's not everything. There's loads of other uh, things in there. And also some things that aren't there, which is quite interesting. No peak at mass 78, that would be benzene. Now, something's got to give the surface of these comets a black appearance. And uh, it's something we would call, think of as polyaromatic hydrocarbons, and benzene would be a good indicator of that. Doesn't appear to be anything there. We didn't see any of this black stuff. Um, not much sulfur, plenty of CO, hardly any nitrogen. So this is mainly carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen that we're talking about. Um, and then some absolutely amazing, there's some really big peaks that we have no idea what they are. So anybody out there who wants to go and uh, work on this can. You can download this data from the Planetary uh, uh, Sciences Archive and, and anyone can have a go at trying to interpret it. We, we will try and do some more experiments in the lab to, to understand that. And then there's all this other stuff here that got to be interesting in its own right. This is all way above background. This isn't noise in the system. This instrument has practically no noise in it at all. So. It's great stuff. And there were two instruments that were doing these kinds of measurements, uh, Ptolemy and Kozak. And, um, and if I normalise those to the, the normalise the two spectra to the height of water, um, <coughs> you can see some similarities and some differences. So again, I think we've got extra information here. What, what, what are the similarities between these things and what are the differences? And... Uh, uh, the, the whole notion of polyoxymethylene uh, uh, as an interstellar molecule comes from observations made by Chandra Wickramas Singh all those years ago. Um, and what this says is that the stuff that we're looking at is not something that's been created on the comet. It is a genuine um, pre-cometary molecule. It's pristine. It, it arrived into the solar system from elsewhere. Right, so very quickly, I've got to wrap up. So what happened? We, uh, this is just looking forward for now. We, we woke up. Uh, we went through perihelion, uh, this, this is Matt Taylor, the project scientist, who's done so much to promote the mission and also get in trouble for his shirts. Um, and this, uh, as we got, got up to perihelion, this is, a, these are the, this is what, the, it scares the engineers to death, see, seeing things like this going off, you know, uh, jets, you know, uh, sending stuff into space. And that's actually the dust environment taken from the spacecraft. And you can see it's horrendous. They, they, that's why they want to get so far away from it. Something's come, something either has come quite close here or, or this is genuinely a large grain. Some of these grains are thought to be two metres in size, but with very low densities of about a kilogram per cubic metre, which is lower than the density of air at sea level. So some fantastic stuff going on here. And uh, something else that scares them to death, that's a picture of the surface. And oh dear. Great big, a great big lump of something coming off, um, uh, and they, because you don't, because they don't know how to calibrate it, this could be up to 50 meters in size. So they're really nervous about stuff like that. Um, this was where the comet was as of yesterday. So uh, here was perihelion here somewhere. It started to move out now, um, and and just to look at that in a in a different way. Um, you can see uh, the comet's now starting to go out of the plane of the ecliptic uh, at a higher angle. So um, the mission is still active. The mission will be still active until September next year. 
And uh, we still have plans to try and communicate with Phil I at least up until January next year, possibly even beyond. So uh, there's still more to come. So the story so far, question mark. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ian. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I certainly learnt quite a bit, and it, it's, it's clearly very much an ongoing story. But we have some time for questions, uh, and we have a roving mic over there. So please wait till it comes. OK, Francisco in the front. I uh, vaguely remember there was a kind of controversy between the kind of water detected about uh, the... Uh, abundance of deuterium or, or something like that. Could you comment on that? Please? Yeah, so one of the, uh, it, it's quite difficult to explain. It's, uh, it seems very arcane. Um, but one of the things that we wanted to do with our instrument was to measure the isotopic composition of water at the surface of the comet. So the thing is, water looks the same here as it does on the other side of the universe. So the fact that a comet is made out of water is neither here nor there. If you want to understand something about the relationships of the water, you've got to look uh, more deeply at it. And, and so you look at the deuterium-hydrogen ratio, for instance, of, of the hydrogen that makes up the water. And the very first results that came back quite early on, uh, they were last year, around August sometime last year, showed that the DH ratio of the water that was coming off from afar uh, was different in isotopic composition from that on Earth. And the assumption was, therefore, that means that water doesn't come from comets. I mean, nothing is as, as black and white as this. And it's quite possible that because it was the first water that was coming off, it would be artificially enriched in deuterium because of the previous passage around the, around the sun. It's a consequence of isotopes is that you can change them like that. So uh, what I want to know from my colleagues who study this is, ha have they seen it change uh, uh, during the, 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 the last few months? And the thing is, you know, everyone's got their own priorities and so on. So I think the story's not complete on that. But the very first results seem to show that it's different isotopically from water that you get typically on Earth. Uh, can you shed a little bit of light on the testing regime for the part of the spacecraft, the lander that failed? Is it presume it was tested hundreds of times on Earth and then perhaps it was just an odd occurrence or do you think it was a communication problem? What, what happened there? It's, it's really interesting. I mean, what, what you really want to do with a space mission is test everything to death, uh, get it perfect and then launch it. But what do you do with something that's got to be in a vacuum for 10 years? I mean, all, all we could actually do, um, you know, no one's going to give you a grant to stick something in a vacuum chamber for 10 years, you know. Um, so what, what the engineers did is they put all their things in a vacuum chamber at the same time that the, 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 um, the lander was launched. And so they were able to pull this stuff out afterwards, or in fact, before the landing, uh, to see whether things had seized up or whatever else. And I, and I think, by and large, um, the harpoon problem remains not understood. And in fact, one of the things that we're going to do, if we can re-establish communications uh, effectively, is actually we're going to fire them again. Because just think, there may have been some glitch, something didn't work, everything points to the fact that they should have worked. So maybe it was something that actually happened during the actual touchdown. This is all programmed in, and, and if something didn't quite happen in the right sequence, maybe it just didn't happen. So, uh, you know, we, we don't know. You mentioned that uh, Philae is, is uh, still on the surface, hopefully. Um, but as the comet approached perihelion, I understand Rosetta was moved away out of orbit. Uh, is it now back in place? And has it picked up anything unexpected? It, I, I, I actually don't know how far away it is currently. I think it's about 300 kilometers away. So we're still actually a, a long way from, you know, the, the closest we've been, we've been at like six or ten kilometres. So, uh, it, it, being able to find Philae in a photograph from the Rosetta orbiter, we've got to be very close to the surface. Uh, 
so we can't we, we we're not close enough to see that it hasn't noticed anything unusual in it in the rotation of, of the comet or uh... um well it, the, the the problem is with the with the communication is that uh, uh, when you get up to about 200 kilometers you, you you're really you're really stretching the the the, the, the you know the technology uh, at that point and I think what's stymied things as well, you've seen the dust, I mean, that's acting mm. to really attenuate the signal. So we have a few, I mean, on the basis of where the signal's coming from, we, we have some kind of idea where the, where the lander is, but I mean, it's quite a big ellipse, you know, it's a, it's a good mm. 100 meters by 50 meters or something like this. Um, but towards the end of the mission, they're going to spiral the uh, orbiter down and ultimately land it or crash land it on the surface of the comet. And as part of that process, we hope to then be able to get close enough to see where we think it was and at least find out whether, you know, is it on its back, is it on its side? <laughs> um, you know, what does it look like? Good, thank you. And over here. And then here. <coughs> Professor Wright, thank you for a fabulous talk. Um, you mentioned that bilobite structure of Rosetta. Have you had any preliminary results of the different chemical compounds to confirm that? And a very quick second question. The, the piece that flew off the comet, what, what, what was that? Well, we, we, we don't know. You don't know? No, we, 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 <laughs> okay. uh, we, we've just seen it flying off. As I, say, the, uh, I mean, obviously, to commentary scientists, the fact that there's lumps like that flying off is fantastic. <laughs> Mm -hmm. To the space flight engineers controlling the spacecraft, uh, oh, yes. <laughs> let's, let's get out of here. Um, no, I think the chemistry is quite interesting I, because, I mean, up until this, uh, this idea has been postulated, um, people were just expecting it to be the same composition. But I think we really now need to perhaps even go back and look at some of the data we've already got and see, you know, was this changing as the, as, as the spacecraft was orbiting? And... Is there, you know, is there anything that says, well, look, we didn't see this before, but, you know, we get a signal on this bit and not on that bit. Um, it'll be fascinating to look out for that. But I suspect what happens anyway, I suspect the surface looks the same wherever you are because of the processes that have happened to it. Um, but, you know, I, literally this, there's 10 years worth of work in here for uh, looking back at these data now, I think. Thank you. Okay, last question over here. Thank you. Yes, a fabulous talk, I must say. Um, I'm amazed you could do any of that. But the, um, you made a point about the black surface. Why, why can't this simply be black carbon dust picked well, up? Well, it, it probably is carbon, because you, black you, carbon dust, yeah. There's nothing there that but, would tell you about... Uh, but but no, none, of, none of the results that have come back yet have... have shown any sign of that <coughs> signal. But would you know whether it was dust or not? Dust particles? Yes. Because there you're are, doing chemical are, analysis. There are experiments on the, on the orbiter that can measure dust particles and mm. uh, make analyses of dust particles. It's all very, very difficult stuff and uh, it all takes a long time. <laughs> oh, that's impossible, actually. The, the, there, are, there are ten <laughs> instruments on the, on the orbiter and so at any one point there are ten principal investigators fighting with each other to get time. For, <laughs> you know, so everything has to kind of you know wait its turn and so on and yeah. the answer to your question is probably there are data that have been acquired already that answer the question they just haven't been processed yet you know people it takes a long time to do some of these things okay well thank you very much before i formally thank ian i just have a few announcements to make so some dates for your diaries uh, specifically for the friends of the RAS. So there's a friends only evening lecture entitled Getting Light from the Darkness, the story of the biggest telescopes. And that's being held on the evening of the 17th of November in the RAS across the, uh, the way. And there'll be a, a friends Christmas drinks reception on the evening of the 15th of December in the RAS library. And it says here, hosted by our president elect, which is me. So I think this is a reminder that I'm supposed to be there. So I look forward to seeing the friends. Are you, are you there. paying for it, John? <laughs> you know me well enough, Ian. 
When did I last buy you a drink? <laughs> and also, for everybody here, there is um, the RS Library across the way it will be open until 3 p.m. today. And so, if you'd like to have a look, there's a small historical depiction of comets exhibition that's been set up. And uh, the space is limited, 25 people at a time. But uh, you, you are welcome to go over and have a look at that. So uh, finally, let me uh, conclude by thanking Ian for a, a fabulous lecture. Um, one thing that Ian didn't say is who pays for this. And it, it's, it's <laughs> yourselves. Um, I should say that, the, that an average UK taxpayer on the entire space programme spends the equivalent of two cups of coffee from your favourite coffee shop per year. And a fraction of that will have gone to this uh, instrument and, and, and to Ian and his team. And I think you'd agree that from what we've heard today, it's, it's money very well spent. So, Ian, thank you very much.